Thank you very much, uh, Josep. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, last year we reported on um, first aspects of the long process of the ESMO consensus guidelines. Uh, this is a final report on that. Um, and uh, the paper, the manuscript, will be online uh, next week um, in the Annals of Oncology and in the printed version of the Annals of Oncology in August. Uh, it should appear normally. Uh, in this uh, ESMO consensus on, that focused on metastatic colorectal cancer, we had different uh, working groups uh, with experts, uh, around 50 experts from different parts in the world, um, and they all co-author uh, the manuscript uh, that will um, appear next week. There were three working groups um, in the process, and I will not describe the whole methodology. There is a very strict and strong methodology. Um, there were three working groups, uh, one on molecular pathology and biomarkers, one on local and ablative treatments and the strategy in oligometastatic disease, and one in the more advanced metastatic uh, disease um, in that setting. And what I will do in this, uh, in this presentation is take you some of the recommendations. The manuscript in the Annals of Oncology will, uh, will be 37 pages. Um, so this will be a very brief overview of uh, some of the uh, relevant um, and some of the selected recommendations, uh, the way they will be printed. Um, on RAS testing, it's quite obvious that we said that RAS mutational uh, status is a negative predictive biomarker for therapeutic choices um, involving EGFR antibody therapies in the metastatic disease setting. Um, and we always added, and you can read that always, the level of evidence according to the, uh, to the accepted uh, tables. Uh, RAS testing should be carried out on all patients at the time of diagnosis of metastatic colorectal cancer, and RAS analysis should include at least KRAS exons 2, 3, 4, um, and, and RAS uh, exons 2, 3, 4 um, with the respective codons. Regarding other molecular tests, uh, two more slides. Um, um, BRAF testing, um, we said that tumor BRAF mutation uh, status should be assessed uh, alongside the assessment of tumor RAS mutational status for prognostic and or also for, potentially, uh, for potential selection for, uh, uh, for clinical trials, as was uh, explained to you yesterday uh, by different speakers. Regarding MSI testing, we said that MSI testing in the metastatic disease setting can assist clinicians in genetic counseling. But also MSI testing has a strong predictive value for the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors in the treatment of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. And you heard more about that also yesterday about the scientific background. And a final recommendation on molecular pathology and biomarkers that I selected here. There are many more uh, in, the guide, in the consensus paper. Um, we were, there we said that also, although a CTC number uh, correlates with prognosis in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, the clinical utility of CTC assessments is not yet clear and therefore cannot yet be recommended. The utility of uh, liquid uh, circulating DNA biopsies to guide treatment decisions is currently under investigation in clinical trials but cannot yet be recommended in routine practice and whole uh, genome sequencing, uh, whole genome exome and transcriptome analysis should be carried out only in research setting. And I showed this also today uh, just to illustrate that we went really in depth in some of the aspects um, in the guidelines uh, paper. The next aspect is uh, to focus a little bit on, on some of the uh, oligometastatic diseases and there we define to a toolbox of ablative therapies and treatments. You know that there are different treatment modalities um, uh, that are available, and we group them into local treatments and local regional treatments. Uh, local treatments including thermal devices and non-thermal devices, um, and local regional treatments including embolic devices and then local chemotherapy. And we discuss that further when we discuss uh, uh, the indications. And also another aspect is, um, that is important and relevant is the, is the standard treatment algorithm for patients with oligometastatic disease, uh, where we said that uh, we should start with the best treatment in terms 
terms of induction of response, do a relatively rapid evaluation after six to eight weeks in these patients. Um, and in this setting, uh, the toolbox instruments that I've shown you on the previous slide for local ablative treatments, uh, precision radi radiotherapy, or embolization techniques can be used um, in this setting, and, and we discuss that in detail. Let's go back to some of the concrete recommendations. Um, regarding perioperative treatment, um, there we said um, that both technical criteria for resection and prognostic considerations define the need uh, for, for systemic uh, perioperative uh, therapy. In patients with clearly resectable disease and favorable prognostic criteria, perioperative treatment may not be necessary and upfront resection is justified. And there was a consensus of more than 75% of the participants. In patients with technically resectable disease, where the prognosis is unclear, or probably unfavorable perioperative combination chemotherapy should be administered. And, um, and then also we said that targeted agents should not be used in resectable patients where the indication for perioperative treatment is prognostic in nature. And again, the levels of evidence are added. And further to continue on this topic of perioperative treatment, in situations where the criteria for prognosis and resectable are not sharply defined, perioperative uh, therapy should be considered. Uh, patients with synchronous onset of metastasis should be allocated to, the, uh, to this group uh, and therapeutic pathway. In patients with favorable oncological and technical criteria who have not received perioperative uh, chemotherapy, there is no strong evidence to support the use of adjuvant chemotherapy, whereas patients with unfavorable criteria may benefit from adjuvant uh, treatment. And of course, in the text, we expand on that. In patients who have not received any previous chemotherapy, adjuvant uh, treatment with Folfox or Capox is recommended. And decision-making should include patient characteristics and preferences also in this setting. Another topic was dealt with in recommendation 13, and this regards conversion treatment. And there we said that in potentially resectable patients, if conversion is the goal, a regimen leading to a high response rate and or um, large tumor reduction um, or tumor size reduction is recommended. There is uncertainty surrounding the best combination to use as only few trials have addressed specifically this topic. In patients with RAS wild type disease, a cytotoxic doublet plus an anti-GVAR antibody seems to have the best benefit risk ratio, although the combination of folfoxyri plus bevacizumab may also, may also be considered and to a lesser extent a cytotoxic doublet plus uh, bevacizumab. In patients with RAS mutant disease, a cytotoxic doublet plus bevacizumab or folfoxyri plus bevacizumab is recommended. Patients must be re-evaluated regularly in order to prevent the over-treatment of resectable patients as the maximal response is expected to be achieved after 12 to 16 weeks of therapy in most patients. Regarding local ablation techniques, we said also that in patients with unresectable liver metastasis only or oligometastatic disease, um, local ablation techniques such as thermal ablation or high conformal radiation techniques can be considered. And the decisions should be taken by an MDT based on local experience, tumor characteristics, and also uh, taken into account patient preference. Regarding uh, lung metastasis, we said that in patients with lung only or oligometastatic disease of the lung, ablative high conformal radiation or thermal ablation may be considered if resection is limited by comorbidity and the extent of lung parenchyma resection or other factors. Re stereotactic uh, radiotherapy is safe and feasible alternative treatment for oligometastatic colorectal liver or lung metastasis in patients not uh, candidates to surgery or other ablative treatments. And RFA can be used also in addition to surgery with the goal of eradicating all visible metastatic disease. And all this is supported by the evidence in literature. Regarding embolization, 
We said also that for patients with liver-limited uh, disease, failing the available chemotherapeutic options, radioembolization with yttrium-90 microspheres should be considered. Chemoembolization may also be considered as a treatment option, but the level of evidence was 4B, and for the previous one it was 2B. And finally, on this uh, general topic regarding cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC, we said that complete cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC can be considered for patients with limited peritoneal metastasis in centers which are very experienced in the use of this uh, technique. Let's then go to, uh, finally, in the third topic, to the more extensive uh, disease. There we define drivers for treatment, uh, for first-line treatment decision, and group them in towards uh, three different groups. Tumor characteristics, including clinical presentation, tumor biology, RAS, and BRAF mutation status. Patient characteristics, including age, performance status, organ function, comorbidities. And treatment characteristics, including toxicity, flexibility of the administration, socioeconomic factors, and quality of life. And of course, in all this also, patient attitude, expectations, and preference should be taken into account. And we went away from the previous grouping systems that we defined uh, in the previous ESMO guidelines. And we classified patients in two groups, the unfit patients uh, directed towards best supportive care and palliative treatment, and the fit patients. And there we have two different groups depending on the treatment goal. Um, in the first group, the treatment goal may be cytoreduction um, or improvement of symptoms and hence avoidance of rapid evolution and prolonged survival. And in the second group, disease control and hence prolonged survival. And in this group, um, the, we, can, we define that, um, that, uh, that this, uh, the clinical presentation is relevant and as I will show you on this, uh, on this algorithm, and that's the algorithm as we, as we developed. Uh, and again, here on the top, you see uh, on the right side, the unfit patients, on the left side, uh, the fit patients. And of course, in medicine, like uh, often, there is also sometimes a gray category uh, with unf what we defined unfit patients, but where we could go for less intensive treatment. But let's focus on the fit patients. Uh, on the left side then of the fit patients, uh, you can see there there are the patients with clearly resectable disease, and I defined already and gave already some recommendations for this group. Um, and then there are the other two groups, uh, the other patients, where really the treatment goal is relevant and is important. And if we highlight uh, from that slide again, uh, this, uh, the treatment goal may then be cytoreduction or disease control. And cytoreduction, as I mentioned, can be there to be to convert unresectable disease or also um, patients with very symptomatic disease. And then if we have defined that, the marker uh, profile also has to be taken into account, RAS status, BRAF status. And then we come up with different uh, um, recommendations in this, uh, um, and that's expanded uh, in the manuscript also. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, cytoreduction, RAS wild type, uh, we recommend that uh, a chemotherapy doublet plus an anti-GFR antibody in the RAS mutant, um, a combination chemotherapy plus bevacizumab, and you can continue this whole algorithm, and you can read that in detail uh, next week uh, in the manuscript, how we define that further um, and, and the different uh, data that surround that. When a patient uh, is treated in a first line, he, of course, doesn't go on forever with the first line treatment. Uh, there may be different reasons for discontinuation, and that's also the algorithm that we developed uh, there uh, to go either for maintenance treatment in some patients, um, um, and then eventually, as you can see on the right side of this slide, reintroduction uh, if there is late progression uh, in this setting, or, or um, in patients uh, that discontinue for tumor uh, progression, or for excessive toxicity, as you can see on the left side, uh, uh, we should consider a second-line chemotherapy uh, in this setting. And that's discussed more, much more in detail, and that brings us to some, us to some further details of, uh, of these previous um, uh, s uh, slides and, and schemes. Uh, in regarding the first-line uh, systemic uh, therapy uh, combinations, according to uh, uh, to the targeted uh, agent used, um, uh, so we set different aspects. Um, biologicals, so the targeted agents, are indicated in the first-line treatment of, of most patients unless contraindicated. 
the VGF antibody bevacizumab should be used in combination with the cytotoxic doublet, can be Folfox, Capox, Folfury. The cytotoxic triplet Folfoxury um, uh, in selected patients, uh, in selected fit and motivated patients, where cytoreduction, tumor shrinkage, as I defined earlier, is the goal, and potentially also in fit patients with tumor BRAF mutations. And also, uh, the, the VGF antibody uh, bevacizumab can be used uh, in combination with the fluoropyrimidine monotherapy in patients unable to tolerate aggressive treatment. The EGFR antibody should be used in combination with Folfox or Folfury. Capecitabine based and bolus ba uh, 5 few based regimens should not be used with EGFR antibodies. Recommendation 19 deals with maintenance treatment, and I will not treat that uh, in detail for the sake of time. Uh, but we said that patients receiving Folfox or Capox plus a bevacizumab uh, therapy as an induction therapy, call it like that, uh, should be considered for a maintenance treatment after s around six cycles of Capox, around eight cycles of Folfox. Uh, and we, we said also that the optimal maintenance therapy is a combination of a fluoropyrimidine plus bevacizumab. Uh, bevacizumab as monotherapy is not recommended uh, in this setting. And, and further aspects, you can read them in detail uh, next week also. Um, the recommendation 20 deals then with second line treatment, uh, second line com uh, combinations with targeted agents, which is a difficult topic. We said also that patients who are bevacizumab naive should be considered in second line for treatment with an antiangiogenic agent being bevacizumab aflibercept in second line. Uh, and the use of af uh, aflibercept should be restricted to the combination of Folfury for patients progressing on an oxaliplatin uh, containing regimen according to the clinical studies. Patients who received bevacizumab uh, first line should be considered for a treatment in second line with either a bevacizumab post-continuation uh, strategy, aflibercept or ras ramucirumab only in combination with Folfury according to the studies, um, and or an EGFR antibody uh, in combination with Folfury or ironotecan in patients with RAS wild type and MBRAF wild type disease. Um, but we have to take into account also, we mentioned that in the guidelines also, that the relative benefit of the EGFR antibodies is similar in later lines compared to second line. And these are important considerations. Patients who are fast progressors on first line bevacizumab containing regimens should be considered for a treatment with aflibercept or ramucirumab only in combination with Folfury. And in the case of patients with RAS wild type disease and no treatment with an EGFR antibody, an EGFR antibody uh, in this setting preferable in combination with chemotherapy. I'm almost at the end regarding third line treatment. Uh, we said out also that in RAS wild type, MBRAF wild type patients not previously treated with an EGFR antibody, cetuximab or panitumab therapy should be considered. Cetuximab and panitumab are equally active as single agents. The combination of cetuximab with ironotecan, according to the studies, is more active than cetuximab alone in ironotecan refractory patients. There is no unequivocal evidence to administer the alternative EGFR antibody if, patient, if a patient is refractory to the other EGFR antibody. Regarding the other new agents uh, that have been approved, we said that regorafenib is recommended in patients pre-treated with fluoropyrimidines, oxaliplatin, aronitican, bevacizumab, and in RAS wild type patients with EGFR antibodies. We said that regorafenib is superior to placebo in terms of overall survival, although there are some toxicity concerns in frail patients with the recommended, uh, with the labeled and approved dose. Trifluridine tibaracil is recommended for patients pretreated with uh, the same agents, um, fluoropyrimidines, oxaliplatin, aeronautica, and bevacizumab, and in RAS wild type patients with EGFR antibodies. And that's level 1b as well as for regorafenib. So that was a snapshot of, um, of what, uh, what is in the long document and the long process. I'm extremely grateful to uh, all, to the two co-chairs, uh, Dirk Arnold and uh, and Andres Cervantes, um, to all around 50 experts, and especially also to the ESMO staff um, who helped us uh, 
with uh, making this document uh, happen um, and this uh, process, which is, we believe, a strong methodological process, and we hope uh, that it leads to a very useful uh, document in your clinical practice. Thank you for your attention.